let's uh, maybe Professor Core can address that as, as part of her presentation, and then we'll have uh, questions afterwards. They really look up to anybody that to who created the Apple device, who creates great cool apps, who makes extremely wonderful video games. They're they're paying attention to those kind of inventors and innovators tech and stuff. tech stuff, and they're seeing that some of them go on to be very. Um, uh, wealthy, and that's very appealing to a lot of them. So, yeah. So I'm not sure that they, um, would, if, if Albert Einstein lived in our time or whatever, something that wasn't so tech savvy. They're real. I think that they pay attention to that kind of science right now, and that is appealing to them. They want to know what they have to know to be able to do that. But um. Well, they see these devices in use around them all the time. Exactly. Mm. Exactly. And it gives them a lot of access to places they never had access to. Mm. Um, my name is Sherry Kaur, and I um, am, I, I've lived with a lot of hats on throughout my young 72 years. And um, currently, I am a professor at, at um, George Mason University working with our seniors who are choosing to go on to teach. They know that they're committed to teaching and they do not have a large science background. So the class that John observed is one where um, I work with them to make them feel confident about the content and also give them ways to um, present the content in ways that would be um, invigorating and inviting to their students. So in a lot of ways, what we all do is very similar. You guys are the experts. You have the content knowledge, and now, Reset is helping get you into the schools so that you can give all that content knowledge to our students. So I've been asked by Reset to um, help um, sort of navigate that road and smooth over that educational part of it. What are the best ways to teach something? How do I get this message across? How do I teach that? And um, I'm really happy that I've had the opportunity that I'm getting the opportunity to do that. I have observed a couple of lessons, and I will say that my first um, instinct, I guess, was to sit back <coughs> and just observe. I had a hard time doing that because what was happening was so much fun. And I think that you guys do a great job already, and all of the suggestions that were given today are great suggestions. Um, the, oh, excuse me. Um, I have it on film. <laughs> um, uh, I, there, was a, there was a great little small study done last year, um, and it was reported in the New York Times that um, they asked students and educators what they thought they needed to have it added to the science curriculum in America that would make it better. And um, they meant three things came up. One is that the students need to know the nature of science and how real scientists work. Check one for reset. Um, students need to focus on solving real life problems. Check two for reset. And the one that um, I think I like the best even is that students need to understand that it's not about how smart you are or how much, um, how much information you have to process and digest, but it's more about um, under being persistent and willing to put in the work. And that um, the persistence. And I think that all of all of you are, are demonstrations to our students that um, with a lot of work and determination and love for what you're doing, um, you have made yourself into a scientist and that it's accessible to these students. Um, I'm not going to go over all the suggestions that were made. Many, many, many of them would be things that I would recommend to you. The only thing that I was going to just um, comment on quickly was Beverly, your word fund. My suggestion would be make your word fund, but instead of putting the word bank at the bottom, instead of putting the words, put the definitions. <laughs> put the definitions. So that 
Um, you know, sound, the word sound is in your word bank. So, you know, by the, and the definition is something to do with vibrations. Um, not besides electricity, I know kindergartners who think the best thing they ever learned was that sound is vibration, and that they learned that the, what, what the whites of the eye is called, the sclera. They went home, I had a parent call me once and said, my kid is walking around going, sclera, 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 what the heck is that? <laughs> and I said, we learned about it in science today. But first grade, do two words at a time. You're in second grade, three words at a time. So add one word to whatever grade they're in if you're trying to gauge um, how much you can throw at them at once. Because keeping it simple and keeping it straightforward is key. Um, you don't want to be up there lecturing like I am right now. You, you want to be uh, giving them as many opportunities to let them do. And it's so, so important in elementary school that as many of the students that you can involve with that hands-on um, experiment or, or opportunity, whatever you're doing, that they all be able to do it. And that, um, that, and that's something that I can help you if you choose to let me come into your classrooms and, and, and observe, um, help you figure out ways to take some of these concepts that, that are second nature to all of you and not so second nature always to Susan and I, um, and bring them, not, I don't want to even say bring them down to a, a student's level, but make them, um, <coughs> divide them up into accessible parts. And we can then take each little bitty part and teach it to children in parts so that at the end it's all a big whole of whatever content is that you're trying to teach. But being aware of what your objective is and what you want to teach them, we can break that down into parts and make it all accessible. And I'm willing to take any questions that you have, and and if you're interested, I'm more than willing to, um, through John, schedule some time to come in and, and work one-on-one, -on -one because I think that what I can help you with is probably um, um, more useful in a one-on-one -on -one situation where we can talk about what you're teaching and what grade you're teaching and what students you are teaching, rather than a lot of generalizations. Oh, the thing they did with the graduate program, we had a woman, what was her name? What woman who videotaped? Oh, the, oh, from GMU, yeah. Graduate school. Okay. And she yeah. was taking a course in how to teach math. Yes, I am. she found. To her surprise, she was French, but that most of the women in her class didn't know the math themselves. Even though it was simple math and she felt she had learned in elementary school, she found that they didn't know. I'd say that um, six so back yeah. teachers, even if you had it, I'd say that 60% of what I teach in my class is content, which is to me very scary as a senior in college that some of the basic science concepts haven't been mastered. And then, but I'll tell you what I find great about my class is that I teach it to my seniors in college the same way I would teach it to my third graders or my fifth graders. And when they leave, they have the content. And I think that has to go back to saying how science has been taught um, historically and that a lot of students, unfortunately, have been turned off from the very beginning. Our 21-year-olds you know, now who are graduating and becoming teachers. Science wasn't taught the way that it's being taught now, and, or beginning to be taught, I'll say. And that reset and programs like it are a big um, part of that, making science come alive bringing real scientists into classrooms, making it seem like a viable option again, that it's not so hard to understand if we break it into those pieces. But yes, yeah. I, I think that's question, key. question, Sherry. Sure. For some reason, we've had a tradition in this country for, since forever of convincing girls that they don't want science. It's not for them. They won't be good at it. They won't like it. Do you think that's changing? I, I wish that I could say that it was changing more than I think that it is. I think we're on the right path, but I don't think that we'll, personally, I don't think that we'll see 
the outcome of that for maybe another generation or I'll so? Be, I'll bet the Chinese aren't telling their girls they don't want science. We're not currently telling our girls, actually, that we don't want science. And we're currently not teaching our girls that we don't <coughs> want math, that they shouldn't be excited about math. However, um, when I grew up, that was the case. I don't think it's explicit. I think it's very subtle. Okay, we have a con question. Yeah. Right. I think I think that's a very good point. Is that what you were going to As a recent, I mean, look at our group, which is recent college graduates. We're a majority female. I mean, it's just one group of people, but you know, we sent emails out to everyone. Right. So no, I agree with there you. There are some universities today that are hard to find enough males to counterbalance the, the number of females. Of women Good. Glad to hear it. What women? Number From my women. side? That is in the science. sciences. In the sciences. In the sciences. Biological sciences. sciences. More so than physical yeah. sciences. Biological I'm thrilled to hear it. I wish I could get that same ratio in the education field. Yeah. No, I'm hearing you. I think I'm hearing and I think that's great. I'm talking about engineering. I think I think that's great. I wish that I could get that same percentage in, in students of education to go in and be as a more of a, a balance because it's not that way in education, in science education. I'm, actually, I'm kind of glad that all those women are going to be scientists instead of teachers, actually. I think it's better. But that's just me. Any other questions or thoughts or whatever? You're right, though. You're right, Sure. Um, yeah. You're right, and, and computer sciences. Yeah. I mean, I grew up with students in twos or fours, and I'm not sure what we do. First of all, all the stuff that is going on in the classics and so And um, so here I'm in a class of, say, uh, history. What, what would be, um, based on previous studies or what have you, that suggests how many students should be in the team? Most often in most elementary schools, the number of students per team is determined by the amount of materials that are available to teachers. Um, if you have um, enough materials, well, all my students get all the materials. then I'd say two is ideal at fifth grade. I think that um, you don't want, as often as possible, students um, of elementary age and middle school age prefer to work with someone else. They don't want to be, they get uncomfortable when they are totally responsible for anything. And so, but when you get a larger group, every group has a leader, and every group tends to have someone who takes over that leadership role and takes care of everything and does everything, and then you, no, not all the students in the group get that hands-on experience. So ideally, I always like to use two, um, and then I think based upon that, if you it's the, the smaller you can keep those little groups, the best. That is, is what I found. Still effective. Um, <coughs> in my experience, it would be four, giving each student a different role. So one of them is the materials getter. One of them is the reporter of the facts. One of them is the taking the notes, the scribe. Um, one of them determines who goes first, who has to go second. So that everybody has a different role, but as four together. That that would be my idea. And the situation, unfortunately, doesn't always allow that, but that would be ideal if there are enough materials to go around. How important is continuity? So when I do aeronautics, which is here in Arabia, last year we did six aeronautics experiments. Uh, this year we are trying to do One is more effective than the other. One subject matter? Should, I, should you do six oh. experiments in an aerofield? Are you getting, I, I guess my suggestion would be to speak with the classroom teacher, find get that person his or her feedback, um, and how your being there is meshing into the entire curriculum. Um, if they're only focusing on one of those topics, which I can't imagine, but... I think there are curriculum as innovation, so we can work either way. 
then I, th I, my, I would say expose them to a broad variety, um, not so broad that it's so, especially at fifth grade. We don't and want to bring it down to too thin board in terms of content, website. but it's, oh, as much as you can expose them to okay. and giving them some meat to hold on to, the better. Uh, I, I have a question. Um, is you pre present this curriculum at GMU, hands-on science basically, um, science um, enrichment, as Susan, uh, her name is. Is this common in education schools these days, or, or is it uncommon? Um, at the university level. Yeah, at the uni for um, for education students. I. I can't speak to a general rule across the country. I'm not familiar with enough of the programs. I don't think that Mason is unique. Uh -huh. I think that there are programs out there. Um, I think that we can always do better. But to be perfectly honest, I have, I have not done a, a preview of, of across universities across the countries in different areas to actually be able to honestly give you an answer. I could do a little research and find out. I, I, was just, I, I think it would be a great step forward um, if, if the teachers were more comfortable themselves with leading hands-on science than, than we find in many of our classes. I, I can say that in this area, Washington, the D.C. area, um, this is my seventh year at Mason, and I have 40, I have 40 students every semester, and I've been teaching for seven years. <laughs> However many that adds up to. <laughs> I've had many students come back to me. I, we, part of the requirement is to create a portfolio a paper, hold on portfolio, not on, not a virtual portfolio, which has caused a lot of discussion talking about technology. But I've had, I can't tell you how many students come back to me where they take this portfolio, which is filled with all the things they study in our class, all the experiments they've done, all kinds of stuff like that, and principals of schools who have called me and said to me, send me more of your students. I can't believe how excited these kids are about science. They brought in their portfolio. I'm hi I hired them on the spot because I saw the kinds of things that they were showing me, the excitement level that they had about science, which is my hardest subject to get my elementary school teachers to teach. And um, so I know I know the program works. I think my gut tells me that it, I, know, I know for sure that it's happening other places. My gut tells me that if it's not happening now, it will, because science and math in this country, the whole STEM curriculum and all of that, we have to have teachers that are able to teach those subjects so that we can continue that, that wave of excitement. Talking about your students, what kind of practicals do they do? And would it be beneficial for us to work with some of your students as volunteers? Um, George Mason is um, not unique, but it, it is. It, they do not have a undergraduate program where, te where students end up with their teaching certificate after a, a combined five-year program, and they graduate with a teaching certificate and to go on. So my students are finishing their undergraduate degree and applying to George Mason or elsewhere's um, teacher certification program. Um, within my class, because it's a six-hour class, they do, they do go out and um, observe, but they haven't been taught a lot of the methodology of teaching yet because they're, they're undergraduates. They know they want to teach, but they haven't been to graduate school to learn how to be a teacher. Do, do they um, so there's not a lot of methodology. No. They do themselves they? would probably be willing and, and wonderful, um, but they're not trained as teachers yet. There's George Mason does them. offer they do offer a, a program internship where uh, students have to uh, invest 45 hours for one credit, and we've had three such interns with Reset. Uh, one was Miranda, that Eva, Miranda Lambert, uh, who... Um, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And I've had many of them in my classroom as well, not just from Mason, but from other universities in the area. Some sort of graduate. Yeah. Right, and it's and it's a it's a great opportunity for a George Mason student to do that. Um, 
I can't remember exactly what Miranda's load was at the time, but it's it's a large it's a large commitment of time exactly. and um, for one credit for one credit. Yeah. Not that that's a negative because we have had students who be, who are interested, but a lot of it depends on where they are in the process of their education, how much time that they have to devote, and that's that's been my biggest. Uh, response when we talk about reset. But the three that we've had, I think have been pretty good. Oh, they've been great. Yeah. How, been how much of a graduate program? I'm sorry? How much of a graduate program is amazing? They offer, they have a, they have a large graduate program. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, this I woman that, that uh, observed my class videotape, she was in the George Mason graduate. They have a they have a large graduate education department, and then under mm -hmm. that, lots of um, subspecialties. So. I know that. But yeah, it's it's it's. I mean, I think it's a good program. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let's thank Professor Core for. Uh, uh, I just want to mention one thing. Uh, Dr. Gunning um, brought up the fact that reset stretched a bit um, into pre-K now. Uh, uh, starting uh, right now, we have a new partnership with, uh, I always say this wrong, Curiology? Curiology. Uh, uh, which is going to take us into sixth through eighth grades as well. Yeah, yeah so uh, Curiology uh, currently works at Shaw uh, School. Uh, let the, will the Curiology members raise their hands? And uh, we're very much welcome to our um, while they're um, setting up here, um, there you should have a sheet that asks you to evaluate the session today, and this will, this will help us in the future. So if you just take a couple minutes, um, and uh, either now or if you prefer to do it later um, as well, but just uh, particularly what what things you would like us to do different um, next time around. Um, Lou has already suggested I unplug that machine over there. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but any anything uh, any other suggestions you have? Uh, we we do these uh, twice a year, um, and we do uh, we do one in Alexandria for our uh, volunteers out that way, and then we do one in Northwest for our volunteers uh, up this way. So we just had one last week in Alexandria, and then we'll have more in. Um, September. So, uh, any ideas you have or suggestions would be very much welcome. So, in the bar, should, the bar is open. Pardon? Okay. Eva has to think about. It. I'll uh, I'll email it out to you if you prefer to, to answer. On, uh, uh, if you want to fill it out online, I'll, I'll email it out. Yeah. I have to run, but thank oh, you I'm so glad much. Yeah, I'm glad you 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 I'm yeah, I got a good one. So, Yeah. 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 Yeah.
once I get the computer two consecutive days, and then the next one, we have like every day, some Wednesday, Fridays, but then the Spanish teachers have the kids two